CBS Sports coverage of the National Football League is sponsored by Subaru. Inexpensive and built to stay that way. IBM. And by RCA, technology that excites the senses. We're back in Cleveland Stadium in Cleveland, Ohio at halftime. The Browns and the Detroit Lions tied up at 7-7, but it uh, almost was a 14-7 game in favor of Cleveland with two seconds to go in the first half. Bernie Kozar drifted back, and Pat Hayden tried the Big Ben toss. And it almost was caught by Reggie Langhorn, number 88. You're going to see him trailing the play, which is right in the position that you want to be. The, the first receiver wants to pop the ball up, which what what happens. And then Langhorn almost makes the catch. Nevertheless, it fell short. And as a result of that incompleted pass, we are tied, as we said, 7-7. In the first half, I think one of the stories has been for the Lions their lack of turnovers thus far. Well, they had a five a week ago, uh, none in the first half. And remember, some of it has to do with protection, because Eric Hippel fumbled three times last week after he was being hit. But that has been the difference. That's why Detroit is in the ballgame, because Cleveland is really the better team. No turnovers so far, and Eric Hippel on a real hot streak. He hit 13-14 uh, of 14 at one point, wound up with only three incompleted passes and tossed his first touchdown pass of the year when he found Leonard Thompson in the per perfect timing play. This was absolutely perfect time, and this was a fake kind of a deep pass, a fake fade pass, as they call it, but then Thompson turned right around, and that ball was beautifully timed right in the numbers. Thompson couldn't do anything else but catch it. Well, that tied it up at 7-7. At the outset, we said we thought one of the problems Cleveland had was their defense against the rush. Turns out it's not the offense, or the defense, it's the offense having problems. The offense has not rushed the ball well here in the first half at all. All As you can see, only 13 yards. And I think, Vern, some of this, again, is that offensive philosophy. I don't think those offensive linemen really feel physical. And that's what you need to have to have a good running game. You need to get in there and punch people, mash people time after time after again. 143 yards per game a year ago, 80 so far this year, and only 13 in the first half. That will be of some concern to Marty Schottenheimer. And we are set to go just about with the second half now, a 7-7 game. The Cleveland Browns trying to go 1-2. and two, And Daryl Rogers' team also trying to go 1-2. and two. Interesting what Daryl Rogers told you last night about dividing this season into two halves. Well, he wanted to say to finish at least 3-3 three and three in the first six games. And he said that because his team is so injured. He feels that he is really playing with a short deck, having so many injuries in the offensive line. If he can get through those first six games with at least a 3-3 three and three record, he feels at that point he's going to have people healthy. He thinks his offense is really going to come around in those last ten games. If they can win seven of those, they can be in the playoffs. Browns will return to open the second half. Gerald McNeil near the ten. And the tiny mite is out to the 25-yard line. You know, I think one of the things the Browns have to do here, Vern, is get the ball downfield to the wide receivers. Lindy Infante, of course, we've talked about him spreading the players around, but we've seen Coach really just kind of dink the ball around. I think nine of his completions were to backs in the first half. They finally have those wideouts with Langhorn and uh, Slaughter with some speed, but they're not giving them the opportunity to catch the ball. They have a first down at the 25. Score tied at 7-7. Gorgeous day in Cleveland, Ohio. Temperature of 75 degrees. Ernest Miner, no yards on five carries in the first half. Goes our quick screen. Langhorn. Blockers in front. Curtis Dickey tries to get the block on McNorton. And McNorton does a good job of shielding himself from that block and helping out on the tackle with Michael Coper. Reggie Langhorn is one of those fellows that uh, Marty Schottenheimer was telling us didn't look fast, but he actually ran 4.3 in the 40-yard dash for them. And again, he's going to hopefully do a large part for their offense, taking the pressure off the tight end position and to get the ball downfield to their outside receivers. Second down and four for the Browns. Biner again, the only setback. Fontenot is wide to the right. Herman Fontenot. Blitz coming. Kofer, Gozar, not too quick. And Keith Ferguson gets his first sack of the day. Now this has been really been the knock on Bernie Kozar's not being able to avoid a rush. Although in the first half he did step away from the rush a couple of times. Here he, it's well defended is really the, is really the problem. Give Detroit defense some credit. There's nowhere for him to go. And that gave Ferguson some time to get there. That'll bring up a third down and eight. Talk to Art Modell, the Cleveland owner, before the game. He said, Gozar, I love him. He's a great kid. But what's going to make Testa Verde ultimately a better quarterback than Bernie 
is that just that his mobility uh, I might need to beat you on that okay third and eight. Oh, dear. John Bostick number 42 almost picked it off it'll be a fourth down can I can I amend my statement <laughs> This, there was a great reaction there by John Bostic. The defensive backs for the Detroit Lions really have very good acceleration. They break on the ball just about as well as anybody in the league. Bostic is right there in the middle of your screen. is trailing Brennan, the receiver. The ball thrown behind Brennan, but he really made a nice break on it, a nice play defensively. And that brings on Jeff Gossett, who never in his career, either at Eastern Illinois or with a variety of proteins, has had a punt block. Still has it. And that's a dandy. Gotta quiet the critics. Manley at the 23. Down at the 29. Mark Harper was one of those. And D.D. Hoggard, number 48, a 50-yard punt. Six on the return. 14 minutes to go in the third quarter. And Detroit has the ball. It's your money, son. But if you want my advice, buy another Subaru. Sure, Dad. I thought we agreed you'd buy a Subaru. But, Dad, I did. The Subaru XT, the Sport Magazine Super Bowl MVP Award. Who has... Transform video cameras. Ooh, making them more compact. Simpler. More colorful. More fun. Who? RCA. With the new Pro Wonder Camcorder. The camera and recorder that uses standard VHS cassettes plus solid state technology for brighter, more colorful memories. Pro Wonder. If you settle for less than RCA, that's exactly what you'll get. It's always been the smoothest, freshest beer around, poured straight from the tap. And now, there's a true draft beer in a bottle. Miller Genuine Draft. It's not heat pasteurized like most bottled beers. It's cold filtered for real draft smoothness. Miller Genuine Draft. Ah, it's beer at its best. Number one draft choice of the Lions, Chuck Long out of the University of Iowa. Won't see action today unless there are two injuries, but just a year ago, he was the great quarterback of Hayden Fry's Iowa Hawkeyes. Remember this uh, fake play and touchdown against Michigan State? Michigan State fell to Iowa 35-31. Well, next week, you're going to have a chance to see the rematch as the 15th-ranked Iowa Hawkeyes with Mark Vlasic now as the quarterback of the Hawkeyes take on Michigan State and Lorenzo White. That's live at 2.30 Eastern time next Saturday on CBS. Well, Vlasic threw for two touchdowns yesterday. Long's replacement. Meanwhile, Eric Hippel has the job as quarterback of the Lions. Broken nose and all. Oh, he's a blue-collar quarterback. First down, 10 from the 29. That's going to be, I believe, offside against Cleveland. Or encroachment. Reggie Camp made contact, number 96. Encroachment. Defense, number 96. First down. Okay, we got two hours to find the difference in offside <laughs> and encroachment. Well, I don't know about that, but it was a nice job by Hipple in that he set that up because in the first half he was going on an early count. There he comes out in the first play here, long count, drew them offside for the easy five Avoided yards. Avoided just like an attorney. <laughs> oh, you're going to have exactly a prosperous, right. to, prosperous career in law. Where'd you get my bill? First, first and five. Right side, James Jones for a couple. And Reggie Camp, number 96, makes the tackle. You had a long talk with Daryl Rogers. They're getting back to the long story. They're, you know, the we want long cries going up in the Silver Dome. It bothers Eric Kippel, but he says he understands. Rogers says he's not going to play long this year unless he absolutely has to. And I think he's going to bring them along very slowly, and that's what you need to do. Again, we've talked about the offensive line, how they are struggling right now, a lot of injuries. The worst thing you can do for a high draft pick and a quarterback is to bring them along too quickly against a uh, with a team, an offensive line that's going to get him hurt, and he's going to lose his confidence. Second down and one, seven, seven ball game. Jones, close, don't know. 
And also, I happen to think that Eric, Eric Hipple is, is a very good quarterback. Now, people all in most NFL cities get tired of the quarterbacks, unhappy with the quarterbacks, but you have to remember, Vern, there really only are four, probably four great quarterbacks in the game today with Marino and Fouts and well, Montana is, is injured. Uh, but so all the rest of them, everybody gets compared to those guys, and I don't think that's necessarily fair. That's what makes those guys great. The other one is Elway, I was thinking of, but that's what makes those guys so great. I think he is going to have a very bright future in the NFL. I'll compare his situation with uh, Jimmy Everett out at the Rams, who just signed with the Rams. Now, Everett will, can play this year because he's on a very good football team, the Rams. He can step into that lineup maybe six or seven weeks from now with a great offensive line, not lose his confidence, hand the ball to Eric Dickerson, dink a couple of passes, and they can bring him along slowly, but while they're doing so, he can be playing. I think history is filled with shell-shocked potential superstars. Steve Barkowski is one of the best college quarterbacks I saw coming out of college football who was beaten up in Atlanta his first five years in the league. Good point. First down, as you saw, for Detroit, 12.50 to go third quarter. Two wide receivers right side. Hipple keeps it on the ground. And a flag is down. So is James Jones. Reggie Camp, number 96, was the first one there, and Jones lost his helmet. But you can see there is just nowhere for James Jones to go. This fellow can be a factor in the game if the offensive line can just give him a little bit of a crease. But Darrell Rogers was so concerned about his offensive line that he aren't be able to knock people off the ball. Face mask, defense, number 96, five yards, replay the down, first down that uh, Jones doesn't have anywhere to go. There's no, there's no creases there in the Cleveland defensive front, and this is considering that the Cleveland defense has been really vulnerable to the run this year. Six penalties against the Browns now for 40 yards, and three of those penalties have come on this current drive. Now, officials have called timeout while they reset the uh, chain marker. They had moved it prematurely. That's what happened. Of the three on the chain, chain gang, one had uh, had jumped the gun, but the other two had stood their ground. So there won't be much of a problem <laughs> marking where it's supposed to be. That's funny. That That's a, an often overlooked aspect of this game, but those guys have to coordinate what they do on the sideline, the chain gang. There are the three of them. It's interesting how the actually the chain markers and things have evolved, just like the equipment in the NFL has evolved over the years. Remember, Bubba Smith was injured hitting a chain marker years ago, and since that point, they've really tried to make them a lot safer. They've taken away the big stakes, and they put some padding on them. Unusual. First down and three after the five-yard penalty. Two-yard gain. Here's Jones going left. Will not get the first down. And here's midfield. Clay Matthews, number 57. Harvey Salem, number 73, quite a story. Held out, paid a $56,000 fine to the Oilers, <laughs> then got traded. It is deductible, though. N number 73, right there in the middle of your screen. He is 6'6", 285 pounds. Now, remember, he is naturally a tackle. He's played very little offensive guard. But this is nice for him. See the way he came off the ball there and knocked at least Griggs initially back but fell off him. He's not. He's used to having someone right on, on his nose. That's a little bit unusual for him. That's why he probably fell off the block. Salem's holdout was generated by his desire to play for a West Coast team. Didn't quite make it. Tough today, too, because uh, Detroit is using so many uh, uh, audibles. Second down and one. Play fake. Hipple looks deep. Man coverage. Good job by Hanford Dixon. You know, Hanford Dixon's had an amazing statistic this year. No receiver has caught a pass for over 10 yards on Hanford Dixon. I was talking to Jerry Glanville who said these corners are the best bump and run corners other than the Raiders in the league. Play action fake, which is which was when you're running uh, Jones so much, should be effective. The ball is underthrown, which is usually a good strategy in a deep pass, but Hanford Dixon was right there to make a beautiful play. Well positioned. That brings up a third and one from the 49 with 11.24 to go third quarter. Detroit four of seven in converting third down so far. 7-7 seven, seven ball game. Good defensive unit. I think all of that worked. Now, that is a first down, but that's still a good defensive charge. Again, and this is the thing they spent so much time on the last nine days, the Cleveland Browns and their Dave Adolph, their defensive coordinator, was getting themselves in the gaps because uh, Cincinnati Bengals and Kennebrew, the big fullback, was so successful against them on uh, the short yard situations. Remember, they had a first and three there, too, didn't they? It took, uh -huh. them, it took them a while to get the three yards. 
That'll be a first down and 10, 10 55 to go third quarter. Eric Kippel is 13 of 17, has missed his only pass so far in this half. He's kept it on the ground the first five minutes. Four man rush. Pretty good protection. Nice catch by James Jones. They're going to bring it back. There are two flags in the backfield. Gary James has his hands on his hips, and I bet you anything he's going to get called for holding. Number 32. Well, he was the man who was missed a couple of blitzes last week, which got himself into the doghouse. You know whose name we haven't really called here, Vern, is David Lewis, the tight end, too, of uh, the Lions. He's a man that you really want to have your tight end involved in the game so it takes some of the pressure off the wide receivers, but David Lewis has not been involved in this game at all. Holding. Offense. Number 32, replay the down, first down. Hmm. That'll make it first down and 20. There is David Lewis, once a number one draft choice out of the University of California. We've talked a little bit about the tight end position. He has all the attributes you're looking for. He is a big fellow who can block, who can get downfield. What he has lacked in his career with the Lions is consistency. But this is, a, I think, a do or die year for David Lewis. If he doesn't do something this year, his career may well be over. First down and 20 after the fourth penalty of the game against the Detroit Lions. Three-man rush by Detroit this time. Hipple goes deep down the middle. There's a shove and no flag. Oh, I don't know. Chris Rockins was defending. Chris Rockins, of course, the man is replacing Don Rogers. The center fielder, he's right in the left part of the screen. Hipple is looking right all the way, and that allowed Chris Rockins to come back and make the play. The right hand was what looked like he bumped the receiver with his right hand. And Rockins was looking back toward the ball, which under the uh, liberalized interference rules the last couple of years would negate any potential for pass interference. He was looking back at the ball. But that was a good play by Rockins. You saw when his initial drop, he dropped to the right half part of the field, but he read Hipple's eyes and then got back over to the other side of the field to make the play. Second down and 20, 7-7 seven, seven ball game, 10-11 to go, third quarter. Four-man rush, Hipple, that ball is tipped, and almost picked off by Chip Banks. Intended for James Jones. Chip Banks is one of the great athletes who play in the linebacker position in the NFL. Remember, he is 6'4", he's 233 pounds, and he can run like a deer. A zone nickel defense here. The ball was tipped and thrown behind, and that's why Banks really had a chance to make a play, but it was just a little bit, it would have been a great catch by Banks. The holdout, Chip Banks was this year, wanted to play more third down situations. And he's in on third and 20. 7-7 seven, seven game, 10-04 to go, third quarter. Browns haven't blitzed much today, might be coming now. No, they're not. James Jones. It'll be fourth down and 15. Chris Rockins, number 37, made the tackle. Yeah, it was really more of a man-to-man -man type of pass, but on third and 20, you're not going to get man-to-man. -man. You're going to get a zone. The idea, of course, was to get the ball to Jones. Hopefully, he could break a couple of tackles and maybe pick up 10 yards, perhaps the first down, but I don't think it's a, it's a tough call against his own defense. Well, the big play in the series, Pat, was the holding call on Gary James, made a first and 10 as first and 20. And uh, as a result, the Lions will have to punt. Mike Black is on to kick deep. Gerald McNeil waits for it inside the 15. Short kick. Watch out. Say goodbye. team scored a touchdown. Right, Felix Wright had blocked a punt last week. 
Barr's kick gives the Browns a 14-7 lead, and they have had the ball in this half for one minute and 13 seconds. You no, know, again, we talked about this so many times already today that McNeil, some point this season, was going to return a punt or a kickoff for a big play. This is it. Now, this is what a team needs. A special teams plays a third of a football game every Sunday afternoon. They have to make big plays, and special teams should win two ball games a year for you. The Cleveland Browns special teams, the last two weeks, have put some points on the board. 5'7", 146 pounds. That's an 84-yard punt return by the tiny one from Baylor, Gerald McNeil. Heart surgery. To perform it, doctors need vital information. At an IBM scientific center in England, computer researchers and doctors are transforming x-rays into three-dimensional models of a patient's arteries and beating heart. This experimental project is an example of innovation at IBM. And it could be another way computers help doctors save lives. Big Q flows, America goes. Uh, you there, Mr. Bailey, that's selling the car? You're buying? Depends. How's it run? Great. Always on Quaker State. That's good. Quaker State means performance. You could depend on quality. I've heard that. One of a kind formula. Stable viscosity. Keeps flowing. Protecting. You sold me. The core? <laughs> and the oil. Quaker State. The Big Q stands for quality. Always has. Always will. You always hurt the one you love. People have a love-hate relationship with their cars. They love them, but they don't always treat them right. Yet amazingly, over 90% of all Subarus registered since 1974 are still on the road. Now imagine how much longer they would last if people didn't love them so much. Subaru, inexpensive and built to stay that way. When the Spartans rock, Lorenzo rolls. Lorenzo White continues on his run for the Heisman when Michigan State hosts the Hawkeyes of Iowa next Saturday on CBS Sports. We're back in Cleveland where this crowd is still buzzing. Herman Hunter takes the kickoff return and gets left. There is a near clip, but no flag is down. And Hunter is out across the 30 to the 33. That'll quiet the crowd somewhat. But there is the man who is now the possessor of the longest punt return in Cleveland Brown history. The old record was 78 yards, set in 1959 by Bobby Mitchell. Did you do that game, too? <laughs> Did all these guys in the Cleveland team yesterday recognize you? A lot of guys come up to you and said, Vern, oh, I remember you when I was a little boy back in Dallas. Ah, uh, yeah. That's the onset of middle age, Patrick. <laughs> too many road trips. 9.26 to go. In the third quarter, 14-7, Carl Bland starts in motion. Hipple to James Jones, up the sidelines and out of bounds. A dandy little bit of tightrope dancing. We're live in Cleveland, Ohio. Vern Lundquist and Pat Hayden before 75,000 who have suddenly found cause to roar. And the Browns are out on top. 14-7 after the 84-yard touchdown run by Gerald McNeil. We were at 7-7 at halftime. Tough to fight a noisy crowd on the road, Pat, isn't it? Well, the best thing it did was return the kickoff back in, in decent field position. Now they got a second and short. They pick up a couple of first downs, and they'll be right back in, and the crowd will quiet down. James Jones bounces off one, gets a good block from Manley, and has a first down at the 47-yard line. One of those tiny things that sometimes go unnoticed, but Pete Manley, the wide receiver, made a good downfield block. You know, that, that makes up a very good point because... When you get, you're going to take another look here, James Jones. Manley is number 82, is going to pick up the block. But there's a second and short yardage. Now, Detroit has not run the ball well yet today, but the defense, perhaps trying to get so pumped up after the big punt return, overreacted, and it gave James Jones a little bit of daylight to move. Kevin Glover is the injured player oh. for the Lions. They don't need to have more problems in the offensive line, but they do. <laughs> really, guys, that was a brand new engine. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I never saw an engine start like that. <laughs> I pat my arms off. Uh, good exercise. Hey, do you remember the cake those guys had? Uh-huh, yeah. That was good draft beer. Yeah. 
That beer was terrific. When you drink a new Miller Genuine Draft, it'll remind you of the best beer you ever had. Because it is Genuine Draft. Cold filtered for real draft smoothness. Miller Genuine Draft. It's beer at its best. Some new engine. Can we change the subject, guys? I want to talk to you about something that could change your life. Insurance. This is the policy from one of the world's biggest insurance specialists. For almost any kind of insurance. Because you just never know when you're going to need insurance. Excuse me. Hey, you big ape! You know who has to pay for this mess? Transamerica. For insurance and financial services, the power of the pyramid is working for you. Ever since things have been made out of metal, there's been rust. And the way to fight rust is with Rust-Oleum. Rust-Oleum renews. Rust-Oleum restores. Rust-Oleum makes things look good longer. No ordinary paint can match its durability. Because no ordinary paint has Rust-Oleum's unique protective barrier. Nobody fights rust like Rust-Oleum. Herschel Walker and the Cowboys' back attack are going to taste Denver's deadly orange crush. Double header action starts with the NFL today, next Sunday on CBS Sports. 9.07 remaining third quarter. That is Kevin Glover, who's out of the uh, ball game with an injury. And Scott Barrows, number 61, has taken his place. Problems for the offensive line. The changing of the guards. Last year, they lost Greco, Dietrich, and Jones. This year, they have already gotten Dietrich and Dorney on the injured reserve list. Now Glover is out, and that's been the weak spot of that offensive line for Detroit. Nevertheless, it's a first down and 10, Detroit. Here is Jones on the toss play, coming to the right side. He picks up a couple. Anthony Griggs, number 53, made the tackle. For the Cleveland Brown uh, linebackers are really a talented group. Chip Banks made an awfully nice play, fought off a block to get in there. And Anthony Griggs, we've seen him both make some outstanding stops on the run, as well as defending the pass in the first half. Well, I've been, been impressed with this Cleveland linebacking core. That brings up a second down and nine, gain of one in the last play. Hipple, 15 of 21, hasn't been nearly as effective early in the second half as he was in the first. That's a good pass across the middle, but it's short of the first down at the 42-yard line. And it'll bring up about a third and three or four. Again, a second and down, an eight or nine situation, or a first down situation is the perfect time to be able to use your tight end. It's an easy target. The tight end is always right out in front of you, the, usually the closest receiver to you. Easy throw, but David Lewis still has not been involved in the passing attack. Who do you think is the prototypical tight end playing right now? Right now, it was Kevin Winslow before his injury. But Ty Christensen's been all pro the last couple of years. That he's one of the throwbacks, too, because he's kind of a big physical guy, not the speed downfield receiver. Third and four, 14-7, Lions trail. Four, five-man rush. Hipple, sack. That is only the third sack this season for the Cleveland Browns. And Carl Hairston got it. Eric Hipple, really, who has a very long history of being able to avoid sack and get out of the pocket, but too much pressure here. Carl Harrison just bowled his way right over the offensive lineman there, and I believe that was Scott Barrels he came over. There's Carl Harrison, third sack this year for the Cleveland Browns. Gerald McNeil back to return the punt of Mike Black. He just uh, counterpunched one 84 yards. High kick. McNeil has time to return it from the 11. And is popped as he gets to the 17. Interesting, Pat. As he came out to return the punt, the crazies in the end zone started giving him a standing ovation, and O'Neill turned around and waved at him. I think they've got a new uh, somebody new to fan. cheer for. Bernie Kozar is the guy who used to sneak in the stadium, he told us just yesterday, toward the end of the, st the, end of the stands here, the young kid. And I thought it was funny. We asked him who he snuck in. Well, who the quarterback was, kind of expecting to hear, I don't know, Otto Graham or Bill Nelson or somebody like that. And he told us it was Brian Syke was the guy that he snuck in to see. Used to sneak in as a boy right there. Yeah, that uh, further made me feel yeah. old. <laughs> it surprised me when he said Syke. Kevin Mack is not on the bench nor in the backfield. Shoulder injury, we are told. 
Here's Curtis Dickey in his place, trying to go laterally, and is bopped by Galloway. Dwayne Galloway from Arizona State. Well, that took, play took way too long to develop, and Ricky Bolden, number 77, the left tackle, was out in front of them, but the offensive linemen have ha got to make their decisions a little bit earlier and allow the running back to make a cut. Uh, how do you like that, your upsets? That is really an amazing score there. Minnesota over Green Bay and the 49ers leading Miami. Chicago with a comfortable lead over Cincinnati. Second down and 13. Ten yards on the ground for Cleveland in the game. Ten. Goes on across the middle. And there is Ozzie Newsom's first catch of the day and the 102nd game in which he has caught a pass. Listen to the crowd roar. You can see him come up limping too. shoulder and he'll come out now Webster Slaughter comes to the near side third down and three with 533 to go third quarter 14-7 Gozar has to call timeout there have been some sloppy elements to this Brown attack so far well Newsom is now at 102 games Harold Carmichael and Steve Largent did catch a pass uh -huh. against the Redskins today which ties him with Carmichael Longest streak ever. Gray, Abramowitz, and Jenkins out of the game, of course. Newsom said, yes, the streak does mean something to him, but it means more. It means something to the city of Cleveland. Well, also, I think it's, it's more amazing for a tight end to have a streak, a streak like that because it's such so much more a physical position. You're getting, uh, getting beat up by linebackers and defensive ends and such. It's harder, I think, for a tight end, and also because tight ends generally are not the primary receivers in passing attacks. That's also the 403rd time he has handled the football without fumbling. That, that is another incredible statistic for me. Not missed a high school, a game since high school. Has played through an awful lot of injuries, which you have to do in this league. A nice guy. Well, it goes back to the point you've been developing throughout the game about the need for a good tight end and how he, that really is something amazing, 102 uh, consecutive games. Houston leading Pittsburgh 10 to three. Steelers scored. But it's such a safe pass for a quarterback to the tight end. Like I say, you always like to use them on maybe a, a first down or a third and three or four. And Newsom's a big target. Third and three right now. Cleveland leading Detroit. The margin of difference, an 84-yard punt return by Gerald McNeil. Goes are 13 of 20 for 110 yards, no touchdowns. Into the flat, Fontenot. Flags are down in two locations. Bartno is finally down at the 45. Devon Mitchell and Dwayne Galloway made the tackle. That might have been a pick play. Offensive interference with what they're calling. You see that an awful lot on third and three and third and four. Bill Walsh did this for years in San Francisco. Still doing it. He's run a lot of pick plays. Oh, that's illegal though, Pat. <laughs> they still do it, believe me. Well, you don't see it called very often. See if they just call interference or the pick play. Offensive pass interference. Offense number 44 decline. Offensive pass interference number 88 replay the down. Third down. Got him. Got two of them. Biner or Langhorn. Number 88, top of your screen there, he was also called for interference, but it's man-to-man -man defense, and what a lot of teams like to do is run the pick. This is just a matter of a push. I didn't think that was an offensive uh, pass interference there on, uh, on Langhorn myself. Well, we couldn't see Biner in that, uh, in that replay, but uh, they did call that on Reggie Langhorn, so that makes it third down and 14 from the 14 in a seven-point ball game, seven-point difference right now. Gozar deep across the middle, tipped, incomplete, the 40-yard line. Devon Mitchell, number 31 of the Lions, racing after it, but couldn't get there. One of the few times we've seen the Cleveland offense get the ball downfield. Now, 
We talked about how Cleveland stretches the field horizontally. I think they're going to have to incorporate a little bit more vertical, vertical attack, get the ball downfield, because they're, they're not picking up anything there on first down on those short passes to the back. So they're still coming up with second and eight and second and nines. Jeff Gossett to kick away to Pete Manley. That will be returned. No, it won't. But even despite the muff, the Lions come up with good field position at the 48-yard line. Now, what's the difference between the muff and the fumble again? There's no possession involved. It just goes through your hands. Just I learned a, that a long time ago. Here's a good example of the muff right here, Manley. He was very calm about this after this. You know what? You can't advance a muff. third quarter good crowd about uh, 75,000 on hand and enjoying the ball game so far Cleveland leading Detroit 14 7 first time the two teams have played here since 1970 and yet Pat Hayden with this uh, possession Detroit's in very good field position once again and I think what they're gonna have to do to get back and get some more points on the board is Hippo who was so successful calling the audibles in the first half it has not done it much uh, this second half he'll throw on first down lobs it to the short man Gary James who puts his shoulder down and uh, demonstrates a degree of toughness in getting down, perhaps for the first down, inside the 40-yard uh, line. He's got some cramps there. But isn't it, again, a delight for a quarterback when you can throw a five-yard pass and a, and a running back and turn it into a first down? And that's just what happened there. Didn't waste any time, turned himself around, and got upfield. Offenses have not been dominant in this half. Cleveland with only nine yards and Detroit with only 45. It's a 14-7 game. First down and 10, Lions trailing by seven. And again on first down, Hipple goes deep. Carl Bland was doubly covered deep by Chris Rockins and Frank Minifield. Hipple tried to look left, look the free safety off, but Rockins, who I've been impressed with, was not fooled and came over and tried to help on, on Bland. Bland's an interesting story to me, too. Uh, here's another shot at Eric Hipple after he passes. You're going to see him get hit. Dale Rogers said he got hit 11 times. Ouch, that right in the chest. He had to surgically remove Sam Clancy's helmet from his chest, I think. But he got hit 11 times after throwing the ball last week. That's too much for a quarterback over a long season. Second down and 10 from the 36. Here comes the blitz. Banks from the outside. Hippo will scramble. Looks for blocking help from David Lewis. And doesn't get anything. David Lewis did not help him. Eric Hippel is going to write a book at the end of his career. It's going to be called Under Duress because that's what he's faced most of his year from the press, the fans, and oftentimes defenses. Good defensive coverage by the Browns here, and that's what really he had nowhere to go with the football, but the added dimension of a quarterback who can move around makes a nice little move. Whoops. And then he, he might, made a nice little gain and put himself in a third and short. A look at David Lewis there, who has not been much of a factor here in the in the well, game so far. Hipple pointed to him, said, help me out. Lewis didn't. It's third down and three. Chadwick, no, nope, short to the middle. Herman Hunter, there's that third down play we talked about in the first half as they utilize Hunter on Chris Rockins. Any third and four or five type of situation, you can go with the back and still pick up the first down. On your left is number 36, Herman Hunter. He's again against the free safety, Chris Rockins, number 37, who's playing in the position of a linebacker, an uncomfortable position. He broke wide open. Now, if that ball had been a little bit better thrown and out in front of Hunter, he might have caught that in stride and scored. First down and 10 from the 19. Lions trail 14 to 7. It's 2.40 and counting to go third quarter. Both teams trying to get to 500 for the year. And again, a four-man rush. That pass caught by Alvin Moore, number 24, and he's down to the 11-yard line. Gary James left the ball game with what looked like uh, cramps in his legs. Not, strat not bad strategy in my mind by the Lions because, again, the Cleveland corners are so strong, Vern. They're tough to pick on. I think they learned a lesson. We saw how well Dixon has played. So Hippo, what's he doing? He's going to his back against the linebackers in his zone defense, and he's been very successful. See the scores rolling by. The Redskins back on top, and Pittsburgh and Houston now tied at 10. Second down and three from the 12. 
14-7 ball game. Hipple looks back at Alvin Moore. James Jones. It's going to be Jones up the middle. And he gets to the 10, but that'll be short of the first down. It'll be third and one. Bob Golick, number 79, made the tackle. Again, remember last week against Cincinnati, this is where Cleveland down inside the 10-yard line, that defensive team really let the big fullback from Cincinnati, Kennebrew, run right over them into, into the end zone. So it's guy, up to guys like Golick right there in the middle, Harrison and Reggie Camp, 96, to get some penetration so James Jones and company doesn't have much room. Word from the Detroit bench, Gary James has been taken to the locker room to check. Maybe a reoccurrence of the muscle injury. Third and one from the 10. Jones gets a block from Alvin Moore. First and goal, Detroit to the seven. Moore turns ship Banks outside and allowed James Jones to cut to his left upfield. Chip Banks did a pretty good job there of shedding Alvin Moore. It was only a third and one situation. Banks was a guy who wanted to play, held out, unusual holdout, really wanted not only some more money, but he wanted to be able to play on third downs. And Schottenheimer had been taking him out on third downs. Now he's back with the Browns. He's a lot happier. Of course, they paid him some more money, but he's in on third downs as well. James Jones, 23 carries, 68 yards. Hasn't been flashy, but has been productive. Hipple, right side. There's Jones again, no gain. Chip Banks with help from Eddie Johnson. I think Eric Kippel was trying to go downfield into the end zone. Again, see him looking left. Then he comes right back to the right because he knows he's got a better chance of trying to get the ball in the end zone because good coverage on the left side. But good reaction by the linebackers for Cleveland. Very quick guys. Eddie Johnson, Chip Banks, Clay Matthews. All those guys can run. Actually, a gain of three feet on the last play. It'll be second down and goal from the six. But the teams will travel some 94 yards to the left because that's the end of the third quarter with our score. The Cleveland Browns 14, the Detroit Lions 7. We now pause for a word from your local station. CBS Sports coverage of the National Football League is sponsored by Miller Highlight. Miller made the American way since 1855. And by Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile quality. Feel it at your nearest Olds dealer. Detroit has not been the type of offensive team that's been able to punch the ball in from this part of the field. More pressure on Eric Hibble to get the ball to his receivers in the end zone. Let's see if he wants to throw it on second and goal as we start the fourth quarter from Cleveland. He will. It's directly across the middle. Touchdown, Detroit. James Jones, number 30. Now we're seeing a real nice exhibition today from both teams getting the ball to your backs. I think... Detroit team has, uh, has made a very good adjustment here in the second half and come out in the third quarter and early in the fourth quarter and realize they can't get the ball to their outside guys. Let's go to our backs. And they've been really that almost that entire drive was made up of passes to the backs. Notice the man with the broken nose uh -huh. is taking the bandage off. He's really getting serious now. <laughs> a guy like that should be playing in Detroit though, right? Absolutely. Eddie Murray will try and tie it up out of Hipple's hole. We are tied at 14 as the Detroit Lions get a touchdown toss. Hipple to Jones. James Jones is the highlighted receiver. He's the fullback coming out of the backfield. Now, Detroit has done a wonderful job of getting the ball to the backs. Now, he can break either inside or outside. This time, the zone defense, which is unusual, this close to the goal line. He breaks inside. Easy throw, easy touchdown. That's a good game plan by Detroit. And a 47-yard drive in nine plays after the short punt by Jeff Gossett. And James Jones has the second touchdown toss of the day from Eric Kippel. Leonard Thompson caught the other one. Eddie Murray will kick off in the three-deep manner. McNeil in the middle, flanked by Fontenot and Langhorn. There is Gerald McNeil. He of the 84-yard punt return in the third quarter. From the goal line. Watch it. Exciting. He is going to be a threat all this season. 
I was a little surprised actually he was so successful because the wedge was a little bit slow getting started here. But he is so quick if he can just pick up one or two blocks out of the wedge, a lot of guys are just going to overrun him here. Well, it, it is tough to find him because he is so small, 5'7", he hides behind an awful lot of those guys. All of a sudden you run right by him because you can't see him. Now that's the good news. The bad news is the offense had nine yards in the third quarter. And they have 10 yards on the ground through three quarters. Score tied at 14. Ernest Biner going to the left, flag is down. And Biner is caught after a gain of three that might be wiped out. But even if it weren't wiped out, they're just not productive on first down, have not been this entire season. It's making it awfully tough on their offense because every time today in this whole season, they've been second and eight. That's not a fun position if you're Bernie Kozar. So what do you do, though? But I think they have to throw the ball downfield. Offside, defense, number 79, five yards, first down. Let's get Ozzie Newsom involved in the attack or some of the outside receivers, Langhorn and Slaughter. Again, those are the guys that Marty Schottenheimer is high on. So far, here's the way it has gone. Brian Brennan recovered a fumble in the end zone after Kevin Mack had come left. Then Thompson tied it up with a three-yard touchdown reception from Hipple. McNeil, an 84-yard punt return, made it 14-7, and Jones just caught a touchdown toss from Hipple to tie it again at 14-0. Vern Lundquist, Pat Hayden here from Cleveland. First down and five from the 41. Gozar, right side. Ball is caught by Brian Brennan for a first down across midfield at the 49-yard line in front of Dwayne Galloway. Now, you haven't been able to ch had a chance to see much of the sting in Bernie Kozar's arm today because he's been throwing much to the backs. But he's an excellent deep ball thrower, and he, does, he can put a lot of steam on the ball. Here he winds up, and a good throw by Brian Brennan. But I think you're going to have to see more of this out of Cleveland. He's got the arm to do it. They can stretch out the defense the way they, like, they line up by formation. They should have some easy completions on the out routes. That is the first first down for the Browns in the second half. First and 10 from the 49. Four-man rush into the flat. Reggie Langhorn for about four. Out of bounds near the 44-yard line. Jimmy Williams, number 59, knocked him out of bounds. And Langhorn will leave the game, and Brian Brennan comes back in. Pittsburgh looking for the first win. Mm -hmm. Down in Houston. You know, one of the things we haven't seen uh, from this Cleveland Brown passing attack either is is hitting receiver on the move, Vern. I think that's where you really come up with big plays. When you have a guy crossing over the middle, you hit him in full stride, and he can outrun some defenders either for a big gain or a touchdown. No receiver has caught the ball on the move, really. Second and five. They'll try the ground game again. This one works. Biner with the longest gain of the day. First down at the 29. We have talked that Cleveland's offensive line has had a pretty good reputation. Dan Fike, number 69, is going to make a real nice block there on Keith Ferguson, number 77. And then Biner gets through the hole. He is not re reputed to be particularly fast, but he got through the hole very quickly there and into the defensive secondary. But it was a block by Fike, the, the right guard, number 69, who sprung him. That was a gain of 15. and gives him 15 for the day. First down and 10. Ball at the 29 in a 14-14 ball game. 13-25 to go. Gozar. Track caught. Looks like he caught it. Brian Brennan. First down at the 19. This pass really has been open all day, but now they finally made some adjustments, and Cleveland is coming back to it. This is a little out route. We saw him throw it earlier and catch it. It looked like he caught it there to me. I thought he had his body way in, in front of the ground, but the officials agreed with me, or I agree with them, one or the other. As we said, the wide receivers haven't been that productive in the 80s. Largest number of catches was by Brennan two years ago, 35. Usually the wide receivers are in the 50s and 60s for the season. Nevertheless, it's first and 10. Finer comes right. Good tough run to the 11. Demetrius Johnson <laughs> slaps his hand away. So you want to play as a defensive player in the NFL? Well, you try to tackle Ernest Beyer. He's 215 pounds. Just a nice little dip there. Somebody's holding uh, James Harrell, number 58. They got a good hold on him, but he lowered his shoulder. Really did a nice job of picking up an extra two or three yards there. Boom, right over people. Second down and two from the 11. Curtis Dickey is in the lineup with Biner. 
Again, Kevin Mack is in the locker room with a shoulder injury. Reoccurrence of a shoulder injury. Curtis Dickey. Demetrius Johnson knocks him out of bounds, but he might have gotten enough for the first down. You know, unlike uh, the yep. Detroit Lions, who we felt could not punch the ball in from inside the 10-yard line with a running attack, and we saw Hipple throw the touchdown, the Browns have that reputation of being able to do that, to getting physical inside the 10-yard line, yard line, handing the ball to Biner and Dickey three or four times in a row. Really amazing, Pat. The Browns were somnolent through most of the second half. And now, all of a sudden, they have come to life after the Lions came back to tie it. Sound I like that. Oh, just hang with me. I'll use more big ones. <laughs> Biner, down to the six. I don't necessarily know what they mean, but I toss them in there. It'll be second down and goal. I know big words, too. Haberdashery, gymnasium, <laughs> all kinds of big words. <laughs> Second and goal, 11.34 to go in the ballgame. 14-14 time. Tell you what, though, though, this is tough to run the ball in from this particular part of the field when you have a second down and goal from the six-yard line unless you can have a big run on second down. Slaughter and Brennan both go to the left side. Harry Holt, the tight end, is tight right. Newsom is out of the game. Has been since the late part of the third quarter. Play fake. Goes off. Almost intercepted. Diving try by Bruce McNaughton, number 29. We've seen some very good defense today by the Detroit Lions. Here's another uh, more evidence of it. Bruce McNaughton off the play fake. Normally when you run the ball generally as well as the Cleveland Browns have, it sets kind of plays like this up. Bernie Kozar really wound up there. But McNaughton read the slant pattern and really had the very good coverage on the receiver. There's McNaughton in his fifth year from tiny Georgetown College. Not Georgetown University. Third and goal from the six in the tie game with 11.07 to go. Blitz coming. Good block. Brennan out of bounds. It'll be fourth down. Really wasn't much controversy on this one. He was clearly out of bounds, but... Kozar, because he got flushed out of the pocket, good blitz there by Vernon Maxwell, it didn't allow him to deliver the ball on time. Now, if Maxwell had been picked up a little bit earlier, Kozar could have gotten the ball to Brendan earlier, and it probably would have been a score. That will bring on Matt Barr, six for six for the year. Had one earlier that was taken off the boards because of a penalty, and then the Browns did score a touchdown. Jeff Gossett to hold, and Cleveland is back on top. It doesn't take them long as they go 32 yards. A little longer than that. They get the touchdown and they lead 17-14. These two teams played four times for the NFL championship in the 50s. Remember the 53 game? Some of you might. Here is Doak Walker, number 37, throwing back to the quarterback, Bobby Lane who goes in from the 20-yard line as Detroit wins at 17-16, their second straight title game victory over the Browns. Interesting, I was with both Bobby Lane and Doak Walker in Dallas Friday night, Pat. They talked about that play. Here's the kickoff. It will be returned. Herman Hunter in trouble. Not the most authoritative return of a kick you will ever see. It's down at the 10-yard line. We've seen very good special teams today from the Cleveland Browns. I mentioned earlier that the, the special teams ought to win two games a year for you, Vern. They've really played, they've played very good coverage. They, of course, had the punt return for the touchdown. That may very well be the difference today is their special teams. Eric Kippel gets set to run back on the field with 10.48 to go. Kippel, 21 of 28 for 164 yards so far and led the, has led them on two very fine touchdown drives. We opened up the game, you recall, in very bad field position on the one-yard line. He finds himself in a similar position again now. First and 10 with 10.48 to go. Got a shot put at that one out. Incomplete at the 19-yard line. 
Jeff Chadwick, number 89, tried to uh, trap the ball but couldn't. He wasn't sure whether he should fair catch it, maybe. Yeah, it, the, it was lobbed. The problem there, though, with Eric Hipple, he got his feet caught in the dirt back there. He slipped with his right foot, which is his plant foot, and never really got anything on the ball. That's part of the baseball warning track. There's Lomas Brown. Scott Farrell still playing in place of Kevin Glover at left guard. Harvey Salem at right guard. Steve Mott the center. And the right tackle, Rich Stringer. Second down and 10 from the 11. Protection is good. Pass is caught. And the tackle made at the 14. Gary James is back in the lineup and made the grab. But Anthony Griggs, the linebacker, was right there on him. And that'll bring up a third down. Now here comes Herman Hunter in the ball game again. And again, this is the situation in a third, and it's about six or seven, where they've gone to Hunter in the, in the past. Now, Cleveland's going to knows that as well. They're going to have to, I believe, double cover Hunter to try to stop him because he's picked up two or three first downs out of the backfield. Well, let's see if they do. Now, Chris Rockins has had primary responsibility on Herman Hunter, number 37. Third and seven in a 17-14 game with 10 minutes to go. goes deep and it's almost intercepted. There was a mix-up, I think, between Leonard Thompson and Eric Hipple. Oh boy, the Hipple just took an unbelievable shot, though. He really did. That's what happened to him last week. You cannot survive a season like that. He did an unbelievably good job of just getting rid of the ball. Clay Matthews said an interesting thing to me yesterday about Eric Hipple. Clay Matthews is the linebacker for Cleveland. He said Hipple seems to throw best under duress. When he's back there, he's got guys hanging on him, grabbing onto his jersey. Somehow he finds a way to make a big play. Lion fans will recall that two weeks ago against the Cowboys on the artificial turf, Mike Black, in a similar circumstance, stubbed his toe, his left foot, and fumbled the ball at the eight-yard line. One of the goofiest plays I have ever seen. He gets this one away, but it's high, not terribly deep. McNeil. Across midfield. Now, did the ground cause the fumble? Yes. Yeah, they called it down. It's a good call. 44-yard punt, 10 on the return, and the Browns, who have had only one drive of consequence in this half, did so last time out. There's Schottenheimer, Schottenheimer and Mc Bernie Kozar. McNeil almost broke another one, and the key, I believe, in punt returning is getting up to field quickly. He sets it up beautifully, takes a quick look, and then boom, he makes a cut. He tries to burst right through. Two tacklers nearly did, but the ball did come loose when he hit the ground. That's not a fumble. And the injured player for the Lions on that play is Michael Cofer, number 55. Might be a cramp in his right uh, right calf. Well, they're holding his knee. Michael Cofer is a fellow who's been a real good blitzer for the Lions this year. He started out as a defensive line, but now he's a, a linebacker. They like to bring him from the outside the relentless type of player. Patrick, I want to go back just a second to that uh, little clip we had of Doak Walker throwing to Bobby Lane. They retired by Doak Walker's uh, number 37 at SMU Friday night. They had a toast to Doak Walker, and Bobby was one of the featured speakers. And what a thrill that was to see those two guys who have been friends since 1939, played together at Highland Park High School in Dallas, and then together with the Rams after they played at Texas and SMU respectively. And I know that in your adolescence, you probably followed them both, right? Oh, absolutely. They were great, great players. And I think it's one of the fun things about football is we all have friendships, but somehow they're developed and, and they seem to be stronger when you play athletics with somebody. Playing particularly football, it's, it's very much a team game. And it is fun seeing those. I have fun seeing the guys that I played with. You know, I just it, uh, you said something to me about great quarterbacks in the game. We're talking about the Browns and the Detroit Lions. And Otto Graham comes to mind. It's exactly why right. I, I asked a bunch of old quarterbacks, including Johnny Ninex and Sonny Jurgensen, is nearly a consensus that Otto Graham was the best quarterback, at least in their opinion. I thought that was a pretty good source. Here's Kozar. Like Quick trip. Bennett wants to throw it. Fontenot is deep. Fontenot has the ball. He learned that from Doug Flutie. <laughs> Give Lindy and Fonte, the offensive coordinator of the Browns, a little bit of credit. Now, this was set up because Cleveland, all they've done is thrown short passes all day long. So as soon as the defensive back saw, saw the short pass to Brian Brennan, they started to come up. And Herman Fontenay came from the other side of the field, snuck, and he was wide open for the play. 
Brian Brennan to Herman Fontenot. And there's no controversy on whether or not that was a lateral. Thank heaven. First down from the 14. Finer plunges inside the 10 and down to the 7. Devon Mitchell and Angelo King make the tackle. It's always amazing to me what a big play, how they'll lift a team, particularly an offensive line. You saw the, the big play to uh, Fontenot. Then the offensive line comes out and dominates the line of scrimmage. They run a play that they haven't been successful on uh, very little today, and they pick up, what, about seven yards. An offensive line, they really like they can get picked up very easily. Actually, officially at six, but that's a gain of 34, followed by a gain of six. It's second and four from the eight. 17-14, Browns lead, 8.50 to go in the ballgame. Biner, flag is down. And so is Biner at the seven-yard line. Well, Brian Brennan says it's against Detroit. Just amazing to me that these Browns had and it is against Detroit. Had nine yards of total offense in the third quarter. One series. But they did have the 84-yard punt return that gave them a momentary lead. And all of a sudden, here in quarter number four, they've come alive. Offside. Defense. Number 92. It's important, I think, here for Cleveland to score a touchdown because they're only up by three. There's Lindy and Fonte, the man. In the, in the hat and the uh, headphones there. The new offensive coordinator he has opened it up in the second half. He's gotten the ball downfield, which he didn't do the first half. But it's, in Cleveland, it's important, I think, to Cleveland get six points here rather than just a field goal. After the half a distance call. The ball will be spotted. Let's see where they finally do set it down. At the four-yard line. And that should be enough for a first down. Yeah, it is. First, yeah, first, first and goal from the four on the half the distance. So it's first and goal from the four. Slaughter goes to the left side. Langhorn comes to the right. Harry Holt, the tight end, is tight right. And the backs are in an eye formation on first and goal from the four. Dickey to the one. Nice surge there by the offensive line, but the offensive line had a little bit of an advantage. They were all on the grass, and the defense was on the dirt in that part of the field. Offense got a little better footing, but nice surge. Watch the push here by the offensive line. This is what they knew. They've really come to life here. 61 there to the center. Mike Babb gets a big, big block. Watch, he's knocking Eric Williams, his man, all the way into the end zone. Great block by Babb, the center. Second down and goal from the one. We're under eight minutes to go in the game. Now watch the block by number 44, Ernest Byer. I say that's an unselfish play, though. That was really the key. That allowed Dickey to cut back inside. Son, you got to be impressed with Byer, a guy who's we've seen him catch balls here today. We've seen him make some beautiful blocks. He's very much a team player. And, you, you know, you don't want to have a lot of superstars in your team, in my estimation. You want to have enough of them, of course, to win. But you need a lot of guys like Byer. That was a 49-yard drive in four plays. The key, of course, was the pass from Brian Brennan to Herman Fontenot. And then Curtis Dickey gets the touchdown, and Matt Barr is on to try the extra point. As the Browns have erupted in the fourth quarter after having been tied 14-14. Matt Barr out of Jeff Gossett's hole. And a somewhat tenuous three-point lead has become a ten-point margin of difference. Curtis Dickey. Let's take another look uh, to the pass to Brian Brennan, who found Fontenot. Fontenot was on the right-hand side of the screen. It was actually a dog, very good throw by Brennan. And a nice adjustment. Big play for the Browns. 35-yard pass that set up the touchdown.
next Sunday, the featured game of our CBS doubleheader will match the first game, Minnesota against Chicago. Tommy Kramer, who is having a big day today as Minnesota is winning and about to go 3-1 and one for the season, will take on Walter Payton and the Chicago Bears. The Bears are also winning big today in Cincinnati. So it, in all likelihood, will be the undefeated Chicago Bears against a Minnesota team that is 3-1 and one next Sunday. And it begins with the NFL today at 1230. Second game will be Dallas versus Denver, or some of you will see Tampa Bay against the Los Angeles Rams. Check the local listings for the game in your area. Matt Barr to kick off, 7.45 to go in a 24-14 ball game. Herman Hunter. And again, that's a rather ineffective kickoff return. There is a flag down at the 20, and I suppose we're going to get one of those illegal blocks I look at it the other way, though, Vern. I think it's good, again, coverage by the Cleveland Browns. The special teams have really come to the forefront here today and have really put them in a position to win this ballgame. Well, it goes back to the point you made, special teams. Absolutely. I mean, you need... The, if they don't go down and, and make a play like that, the offense starts generally 10 or 15 yards Illegal more up block. the field. Under run back, number 51. First down. Now, this is the third time today that Eric Hipple will start a drive inside the 10-yard line. And if you look at the statistics in the NFL, the chances of scoring a touchdown from inside the 10 when you have to drive over 90 yards are really less than 10%. There is an injured player for Detroit up at the 30-yard line, Michael Kofer, who was hurt earlier, was re-injured on the uh, attempted kickoff return. Trainer is out, tending to him at the 30-yard line. Kofer from Tennessee. The Lions need two touchdowns to win this ball game. They've got a long way to go here yet. But, however, Cleveland still has not been able to stop the back out of the backfield for the Detroit Lions. Gopher is having problems with cramps and has had, so, uh, had those problems here in the second half. Browns had nine yards total offense in the third quarter, but they've come on in the fourth. Detroit with 252 yards total offense so far, and Cleveland with 214. First down and 10. Hipple out of the backfield, Pat. And it works to perfection out of the 17. I think what Cleveland's going to have to do is say, hey, our defensive backs, our corners can handle their receivers one-on-one. -on -one. Linebackers don't take deep drops. Let's, and, and the tight end is ineffective for Detroit as well. So why don't we double each back with linebackers? They haven't thrown the ball to David Lewis. Pittsburgh and Houston still tied. That's of uh, very great interest to the people in Cleveland. Division rivals playing each other. Second down and one from the 17, and the clock shows 6.59 to go in the ballgame. Release foul pass to James Jones. That does get the first down, but that clock's still running with 6.45 to go. You know, this is a time of the game where uh, uh, I'm not... I'm going to take another look at Eric Hipple, who is, again, once more under duress. He has a second-and-one situation, so he, need, he knows that he needs very little. He did a smart thing here, I think, because he could have picked up the first down rushing himself, but he figured, ah, I'm going to let James Jones get hit rather than me. But I'm not, I'm not sure why Detroit isn't running their two-minute offense here. Precisely with 6.18 to go in the game. two touchdowns. That pass tipped away by Hanford Dixon, intended for Pete Manley, number 82. It'll be second and 10. I'll tell you what, if you're a quarterback, in my estimation, you stay away from Hanford Dixon. He has earned my respect, and I believe Eric Hipples today. We've seen him make three tremendous defensive plays without causing interference, which to me is remarkable. Checks in at 5'11", 185, which really is not all that terribly small by cornerback standards. He's referred to by many as a very slight cornerback, but uh, Detroit now with a second and 10 from the 21. Hipple is 24 of 34 for 179 yards. That pass up and across the middle, the tight end, David Lewis, finally makes a catch and gets in the ball game. We saw an interesting adjustment, adjustment by Cleveland. They, they blitz their linebackers. That's one way of forcing the, the backs to stay and watch in the middle of your screen. The linebackers are going to blitz. Now, the offensive backs have to stay in the backfield to pick them up. 
but that leaves the tight end David Lewis wide open. So we saw a point counterpoint. Cleveland tried to stop the backs by blitzing. Eric Hipple read the blitz, got the ball to the open receiver tight end. That's good defense, I think, and offense. They've only got 535 remaining in the ball game, though, and they do need two touchdowns. First and ten. Eddie Johnson leans up, says, let's change our defense, and they do. Now, Hipple didn't have time to adjust to that. Manley gets out of bounds to stop the clock at the 42-yard line. It's Gary James, not Manley. Number 32 instead of 82. Watch Eddie Johnson, number 51. Well, you see, he sees Eric Hipple change his offensive play, so he's going to say, well, if he's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And now he's wondering, does Hipple have the right play for the new defense? Hipple made the adjustment found Gary James, who's been an effective receiver out of the backfield today. But again, Cleveland's playing that backup zone with the linebackers pretty soft, and it's left an awful lot of territory for those backs. Matter of fact, Pat, they have caught 15 passes between them. James Jones has nine receptions. Gary James has six. James Jones, that's good for a first down. And the fumble occurred after Jones was down. The clock will keep running with 5.04 to go. Really, if they need two touchdowns, they should be in their two-minute offense so they wouldn't be wasting much time in the huddle. 40% of their game plan was audibles anyway, and he can easily do that from the line of scrimmage. Washington and Seattle having a tough battle, as you saw. Largent caught a touchdown pass to narrow that margin for Dave Craig. Our score is 24-14. Cleveland leading Detroit with 4.40 to go in the ballgame. First and 10, Lions at the 48-yard line. They're taking too much time in my, my estimation. For I agree. It pulled to David Lewis. Down to the 44. Not only that, but they're, they're having to, or, or not having to, but they're keeping these men in the middle of the field and not getting out of bounds. It, it's exactly right. And when you know that you need two touchdowns to win the football game, and the clock is only 4.09 left in the ball game, you want to be able to, to get up in the line of scrimmage, audibleize, and that was most of their game plan coming in today. They're moving the ball, but eating a lot of the clock. Second down and three. It's overthrown. Look who he was picking on, though, is Hanford Dixon, number 29. Again, we mentioned earlier, no receiver has caught a pass against Hanford Dixon over 10 yards this year. That brings up a third down and three. Eric Kippel, 28 of 39 for 215 yards. The matchup again here to watch is Herman Hunter against number 37, Chris Rockins, the free safety for Cleveland. This has been the ideal circumstance for them to use that, hasn't it? One way to stop it, though, is to blitz. Then he's got to stay in and block. All right. Let's see if Cleveland does. We got third and three. Looks like they might. Now they're sending four. And the pass is complete to the 39-yard line. Pete Manley makes the catch. And that moves the chains. Moves the chains, but they should be over the ball, calling the next play. They may not get the ball back. That's right. Well, they have moved this ball from their own nine-yard line, but gosh, the time is evaporating. And they need two touchdowns to go on top. Jones and Gary James in the backfield again. 3-10 to go. they're going to say that he was down yes chip banks made the sack guess who missed the block Vern? it was number 32 gary james who missed the block on banks chip banks one of the great athletes in the nfl he's going to come from the blind side he didn't get a chance really to see him but it was james number 32 who missed the block and i don't know that that ball that player was down before the fumble occurred it looked like the ball might have squirted out chip banks with the sack well, normally a guy coming from the right, the quarterback can see him and make a little move to make a miss, but Hipple was looking to his left, had no chance. But James should have easily have picked him up. Loss of eight, second down and 18 with 2.45 remaining in the ballgame. And the clock inexorably winding down. Hip 
hole deep for Lewis, incomplete. Stops the clock with 2.35 to go in the ballgame. 24-14, Cleveland leads it. They have scored the last 10. 49ers rolling over Miami. Boy, that Miami defense is having some problems. 50 in one game they gave up. 51 last week to the Jets and 31 today. Darryl Rogers not worried about that right now, though. Well, there's two ways of looking at this. They've, with only 235 left, they're going to have to go for it on fourth down. So it's third down here. They can pick up half, perhaps, with one pass, and then end up in a fourth and eight and try to pick that up. Third and 18. Fourth and 28. Sam Clancy, number 91. Carl Hairston, number 78. That's Clancy's third sack this year. It's a real frustrating feeling for a quarterback knowing that the defensive linemen know that you have to throw the ball, that they're going to tee off and be able to come in. Number 91, Sam Clancy, didn't play any college football, made a real nice play, fighting off a block. Just threw a guy away and made the play on Hipple. And the bad news is magnified oh, because Lomas Brown, their best lineman, is down. And you could see it on the replay when he got blindsided from the from the right side. Dale Rogers said last night that he's so concerned about injuries with this team that he wanted to come out of his first six games at least three and three, but more importantly, healthy because he felt many of his players who were injured would be back by then. But I'll tell you what, they may not be healthy. They may not be three and three either. I'll watch it again and you can see Lomas Brown as he is hit from the right side. It'll be in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Watch the right side as Lomas Brown and Scott Barrows are trying to do the double team. And then there right there is where Brown goes down. They can't really afford any more injuries in that offensive line. They're going to have to either make a trade or bring somebody off the waiver wire or something. That... Dorney and Dietrich already on in the injured reserve list. Watching back home in Detroit today, I'm sure. Guess... Kevin Glover is already out with an injury in this game. Really, and... Go ahead, Pat. Really is their best offensive lineman now. Dorney is coming off I IR a week from now, so that will help some. But looks like he might shake it off here, which would be great news for the Lions. Don't forget, at the conclusion of our game, we'll have the NFL postgame show. That's next. Scores and highlights, plus an update on the instant replay poll. Last report, we had 148,000 who had called in to register their vote, 30% of whom said keep the instant replay in its current form. 44% said uh, keep it but in revised fashion. And 26% said no, get rid of it. Halftime, Pat Hayden made his call. I think we've got enough technology in our lives as it is. One of the reasons I think people come out to watch games and athletes is because the human elements involved. We don't need more technology. <laughs> I think all you need to do is get guys in the replay booth who think about buzzing the official and say, okay, look, we're looking at this. Hold it. Well, if you're going to use it, you got to have some guys with some courage up here. That's I'll tell you right. That. Fourth down, and the Lions have chosen to punt on fourth down and 26. McNeil, that's a fair catch. And it's down at the five-yard line. Scott Williams, number 38, got down to down the ball. And the play is stopped with 2.02 remaining in the ballgame. I think there was a real, in my estimation, a... a something that the Detroit offense should have really done. It was out used their two-minute drill when they took over on the on the 10-yard line. Now, it turned out they had a sack and it didn't make much of a difference, but they used way too much of the clock. They may never see the ball again. There's two only two minutes left in the ball game here, and I, I think that was a fundamental error offensively. And I think that, in my mind, that blame goes on both the quarterback, the offensive coordinator, and the uh, and the head coach. You have to realize the time very much becomes a factor when you need two touchdowns. And now only 2:02 remain. We'll have this play and then the two-minute warning. Kozar will keep it on the ground. Ernest Biner. If it had been Kevin Mack, he might have been gone. Biner's not the fastest back in the world. And Dwayne Galloway 
saves a touchdown. It's a 37-yard gain. But he is awfully determined, if not fast. So often this happens on basically what is a short yardage defense because Detroit is trying to stop them. They know they're going to run, but he's twisting and turning. You also have to be careful in those kind of situations that you don't fumble the ball. But he is such a determined runner, the kind of guy that's going to give you everything he has to try to help his team win. Timeout. Two-minute warning is next. 152 remaining in the ball game. The Cleveland Browns leading Detroit with 10 unanswered points here in the fourth quarter, 24 to 14. And the Browns have a first down at the 44-yard line. There is Lomas Brown. Word from the bench. He just had the wind that knocked out of him. That's good news for Detroit Lions fans. First down and 10. Ball on the 44. will use one of their timeouts now to stop the clock with 144 to go 143. Well, I thought they would. Now they do. Uh, two left after that one. Demetrius Johnson and Shelton Robinson make the tackle. Ernest Biner at one point had five carries for zero yards. He's now got 67 yards on 11 carries. That last drive, 12 plays, five minutes and 42 seconds and zero points. Well, that's the, really the bind, and the issue there was the five minutes and 42 seconds. I think they probably could have gotten the 47 yards in much less time had they used their game plan a little bit differently. As a matter of fact, let me give you a shocking statistic. In the ball game thus far, Detroit has run 73 plays, Pat, to 48 for Cleveland, and the time of possession is 38 minutes and 56 seconds for Detroit to 19 minutes and two seconds for Cleveland. But what has been the difference has been the punt return, of course, by Cleveland and special the coverage teams. and the special teams because Detroit started drives three times inside their own 10-yard line. They've had to go the long distance. And as a result of that, they have a 24-14 edge. Demonstrating once again, you can prove anything with statistics. <laughs> or nothing with statistics. 141 to go in the ballgame. Lions can kill it two more times. to the 46. Cleveland, this will be this is a big win for them. They'll go to 2-2 two and two and tied for first place in their division with Cincinnati. Cincinnati losing to the Bears today. Well, actually, it's in the uh, definitely losing to the Bears today in the fourth quarter. So they're right back uh, where they started the season. 2-2, two and two, tied for first place. And I still think Cleveland has a chance to be a very effective and good football team. Esiason in that Cincinnati loss, last we checked, had thrown four interceptions. Hmm. So Marty Schottenheimer's team will be tied with Cincinnati at two and two. And the Browns have uh, a trip to Pittsburgh next week where they have lost 16 consecutive games. Isn't that amazing? It sure is. But the season's a fourth over. The Browns are now tied for first again. Remember, they won the division last year with an eight and eight record. A similar record, I think, will do it, an eight and eight or a nine and seven in that division this year. And so they're, they're not in bad position. Now, Detroit, on the other hand, is going to go to one and three. We mentioned that Daryl Rogers wanted to be at least three and three. So he's going to have to win his next two. Well, he's got Houston at home next week, and then he makes a trip to Green Bay. But then they've got to go out to Los Angeles to take on the Rams. So the three and three is a possibility, I would think, against Houston and Green Bay. And again, his reasoning on that six-game part of the schedule is that he's got a lot of guys coming off the IR, and he's going to get his offensive line healthy again. And then he feels his offense is going to be effective. 135 remaining. Lions can stop it one more time. It's third down and nine. Gozard, the flat for Miner. Fumble. Lions have it at the 49-yard line. Now, this is interesting. Well, they just call timeout, and the clock stops on a change of possession. That's a silly, uh, you're at the, right, a silly called timeout. A little bit of a surprising call. I think Cleveland felt that Detroit would be expecting the run, so they went with the play action fake. Biner makes a little catch out here in the flat, but he gets a severe hit there by Galloway, number 40. The ball popped loose. Now, the interesting thing here would be with 128, they still need the two touchdowns, of course, but they have time to do it. A touchdown, perhaps an onside kick. Maybe even actually the field goal to put it in overtime. Yeah, that's a thought. 
want to see if, if uh, I don't think Detroit was charged with the time out there. They were not. They were not. They call time, but they were not. Here's Hipple. Uh -oh. Double coverage. There was no one in blue within 15 yards of the ball. Well, he is motioning there to his wide receiver, Pete Manley. He thought he was going to break inside against the double zone there, but that was a very lucky that wasn't picked off. We just, still just to reiterate, Pat, even though the Lions asked for a timeout, the officials did not grant them one, so they still have one timeout left. Go ahead. Well, again, now we've always talked about two touchdowns. Remember, a touchdown, perhaps an onside kick, and a field goal will tie it up. Second and 10, 121 to go. <laughs> Carl Hairston is going to claim he was drawn offside. <laughs> no, I... Defense, number 78, five-yard penalty, second down. He's not going to win the argument. Yeah, I think he knew he was the guilty party. <laughs> It'll be second down and five. And 121 remaining in the ballgame. Lions have one timeout remaining. Gary Kippel for the game, 42 throws, 29 completions. In the flat, James Jones, nice catch. Hurries to get out of bounds and does. He didn't gain much yardage, though. Well, he didn't gain any yardage. That was part of the problem. I mean, you have to pick up the first down and then get out of bounds if you can. Remember, the other thing here for the Detroit Lions, they have a kicker who's got 11 53-yard field goals in his basket as well right. in his career, which is another thing to consider potentially. They've got a third and four now from the 43. Now will we see Herman Hunter out of the backfield? Leonard Thompson out of the backfield. That's good for a first down. He was lined up to the left, wasn't actually in the backfield. But with 105 remaining, now the Lions will go without a huddle. This still could be a very interesting finish to this ball game. Under a minute remaining, 24-14. and call time and does and stops the clock with 40 well he hasn't called time now he does lost five seconds lost seven seconds he was down with 42 seconds to go I don't know whether he just couldn't find an official to call time, but uh, he was down and lost seven seconds, but did finally get the timeout. He call. was trying to actually line his team up to get another play off there. What he could have is either going to try to throw the ball out of bounds and save his timeout for potentially, if they scored, they might have needed that timeout for a, for the field goal, the long field goal to tie the ball game. I don't think it was necessarily a bad play on Hipple's part. Now they're uh, out of timeouts, but they've got 35 seconds left. Well, they've got, they've got to throw the ball into the end zone here. They've got to throw the ball into the end zone. There's no sense of trying to pick up a first down here and getting out of bounds. In my mind, they've got to throw four balls into the end zone, hopefully score early enough, maybe with 25 seconds left, kick an onside kick, perhaps make, make a, a play, a pass, where they can get their field goal kicker in the game to kick a long field goal, tie it up, go in overtime. Nothing to it. <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? Sure, it does. I like but it your can strategy. Be done. It, it can be done, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Five seconds to go in the ball game, and the Lions have a fresh set of downs with a first down and ten. Left side, Carl Bland up in the air, incomplete. Pretty good tussle deep with Mark Harper, the fifth defensive back, and Carl Bland. A lot of pushing and shoving going on there, but Mark Harper had his head turned back to the quarterback, and that allows him to be able to go up and has every right to catch the ball as the receiver does. As an offensive person, do you like that rule? The new oh, yeah. I, I, do you? I, I think it's a fair rule. But this also, the, the clock in only 29 seconds, emphasizes that maybe Detroit should have run that two-minute drill earlier on, way earlier on, and would have had a lot more time to play with I right now. I think it reemphasizes the point that we made during that six-minute drive. Has a man open. Overthrows it. Carl 
planned again the intended receiver still time two more passes into the end zone you obviously just from a time standpoint you want to get this one into the end zone but Pat they've done precisely what you said they had to do and that's don't waste time with seven yard outs and it's not going to do any good at this point they've got to get the ball into the end zone two more chances and they'll go without a huddle even though they had stopped the clock on the incomplete pass this is to check with me at the line I guess just call it at the line of scrimmage Great catch. catch. James Jones popped and kills the clock with 17 seconds. And look at him bounce back up. This man is a, you talk about throwback. This is a tough, tough throw. Now, we, we said he had to throw into the end zone. Here's the one exception where James Jones actually caught the ball and was out of bounds or caught it and then got out of bounds because of the big hit. But very, very dangerous. That is a real big play there by James Jones. We're going to have a real interesting finish, I think, here. And that's 12 catches for Jones today. 17 seconds to go. First and goal from the three. And you see the clock, lower right-hand corner. 24-14 the score. Touchdown, Detroit. With 14 seconds remaining, Carl Bland makes the catch. Hipple's third touchdown of the day. Obviously, the extra point is very important. Nice play here by Detroit because Hippo got rid of the ball quickly, again, saving himself a little bit more time on the clock. It wasn't a big, deep drop. It was a three-step drop. Boom, he unloads it into the, touch, uh, into the end zone. They waste very little time to get the ball in the end zone. They scored on first down. I just wonder if this thing ends this way, 24-21, assuming that Murray gets the extra point. Think back about that six minutes. The six-minute drive where they came up empty. Murray has brought the Lions to within three points. It's 24-21 with the onside kick to come. Well, mir miracles definitely have happened before in the NFL. And we mentioned a little bit earlier, that man, Kevin Murray, has had 11 field goals in his career over 50 yards, which obviously becomes a factor now. There is no wind, so that is not a factor. What they need is a decent return, which they have not had. And they need one pass, maybe maybe one pass so they can pick up perhaps 10 yards. Well, let's see what they've got in mind for the onside kick. There are all sorts of gadgets. Did you as a, as a Ram team spend a lot of time on things like this, onside kicks? Oh, absolutely. Did you? Every week you did. Uh -huh. I personally didn't, thank goodness. So. Right. <laughs> Now you can squib kick it, you can tick kick it on the top and have it bounce four or five times and take the funny hop. Well, again, generally the ball on, on grass doesn't take as many funny hops as it would on AstroTurf. I think the, the kicker who can, some kickers can do the onside kick with either foot. And I think that's advantage because most teams will expect the right-handed kicker to kick it with the right foot and so the Browns have Ozzy Newsom over here and Rockins and all the guys who are used to catching the ball on the right side of the field. Now, if he were to kick that with his left foot, I think it would be more of a surprise. Fourteen seconds remaining in our ball game. The Lions have just scored their third touchdown to narrow the margin to 24-21, and they are about to attempt the onside kick. Trailing the Cleveland Browns with 14 seconds to go. Carl Bland just caught the touchdown. Here's Murray's onsider. Ozzie Newsom makes the grab for the Browns. And Pat Hayden, you just pointed out that they had him, the aging vet out there on special teams. That ball needed to have one more bounce to be an effective onside kick. It took one bounce, popped up. It was an easy catch for Ozzie Newsom. He needed to hit it on the top of the ball a little bit more, take two bounces, then it would have been more like a squib kick. So the Lions, out of timeouts, cannot stop the clock. 13 seconds remaining in the game. The Browns were tied at 14 all and then put together two good drives in this fourth quarter to take a 24-14 edge. Lions just recovered a fumble at the 49-yard line and got a touchdown toss, ultimately, from Mary Kippel to Carl Bland to cut the margin to three. And now Bernie Kozar will stop the clock. And that will be the final play of the day as the Cleveland Browns outlast the Detroit Lions in a well-played ball game. The final for Marty Schottenheimer and his crew as they go to 2-2, 24-21.
And Darrell Rogers and his bunch fall to one and three. But I think he thought uh, saw some things to like in this ball game. Went at 24 to 21, despite being outgained offensively. But again, Pat Hayden, the special team, such a critical factor in this game. They were not uh, impressive offensively. They really weren't particularly running the football. I think their defense played well, and that was one of the question marks at the top of our show: how well the defense would play. But in, if they're going to be a contender in the Central Division of the AFC, I think their running game, their offensive line, is going to have to do a, an awful lot more. The Browns do win it 24-21. They go to 2-2. Two and two. The Detroit Lions fall to 1-3 and three for the year. And we'll be back at Cleveland's Stadium in just a moment. <laughs> 